Hi everybody. So last class we learned about common US urban models. Today we're going to look at foreign urban models in three major areas. We'll look at Latin America, we'll look at Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. There are patterns for some other places in the world, for example, uh, European cities and Middle Eastern cities tend to have a really old urban core. Um, often that urban core is surrounded by a wall or lots of walls. Uh, the same can be true in some East Asian cities. This is just because uh, the cities are so old that uh, one of the more common ways of defending cities back in the day was to just build a wall around it. So. As cities expanded, you would simply build more and more walls. There are some cities in Italy, for example, um, some cool stuff on the internet, which maybe I'll post a link for, that uh, have multiple walls. So it's kind of neat. Anyway, we'll look at just three. These uh, models, you can see, I have a, an FYI there that says uh, there are many cities that would not fit these. So when you are done with this lecture you're going to try and find one city in the real world that fits these examples uh, so you'll find three cities one for each of the three models and uh, you might have to look around a, a bit but um, at least uh, one i can tell you that will sort of help you get started with that work in zimbabwe check out harare spelled h-a-r-a-r-e there are others, um, but uh, you'll start to notice that you can't just look at any city. So just be aware the generalizations are helpful, um, but you might have to check out more than one city. All right, let's get started. Wow, that's pretty. Your task is to draw that. Maybe you've drawn it already in your notes, but uh, I'll first tell you that for this Latin American model and for all of our three models today, it's helpful if you draw them, at least in my experience as a teacher and a learner, because it activates a different part of your brain than if you just stared at it for a while and tried to learn things from it. That's certainly helpful as well, but kind of like how your Rostow rocket uh, was more memorable than if we'd just gone through the five stages of Rostow. Uh, drawing it will activate a different part of your brain, makes the information a little bit more sticky. So. Take a couple minutes, whatever you need, probably more than two. See if you can draw this, label all the parts. It's gonna be a mess, uh, but you'll probably learn a bit. So if you wanna pause it here, feel free to pause it. I'm gonna continue uh, with the notes on what makes this model uh, typical for Latin American city. So one thing that's different from US urban models is that it's got a two-part central business district. Uh, basically all the models today are gonna to have multiple central business districts. Uh, part of the reason for this is because when uh, European colonizers would come into any area, whether it was Latin America or Africa or Asia, the people living there already would have had something resembling a central business district. It would have been the center of town where a lot of the traditional markets were, were uh, where people from all around the city would come in and try to sell their stuff. So if you look at the very center of the Ibero-American Griffin Ford city model, we've got these two areas. These are both part of the CBD. So this is your traditional CBD called the market. And right next to it is sort of a modern day central business district as we know of it in the West where you've got big tall buildings and things like that. The wealthy residents will be living somewhere near this, uh, what's called a spine next to the commercial space. So this is a uh, commercial space where you'd have a lot of uh, offices, uh, but also stores. So think of it sort of like a continuation of the CBD, but less dense. And out here on the edge, we have a larger amount of that space. The mall is just sort of the same stuff as the spine. It's just a little bit different because it's kind of like its own edge city. And you can see around the outside of that, you've got the most desirable housing. So they wanna be close to uh, nice high-class shopping and offices. Similar to models that we looked at for the US, the lower class housing is far from the upper class housing. Not too far here in the developing world, but uh, it's far from it generally. 
So it's all the orange stuff here. I, I'm not a huge fan of how this um, model was drawn. I think it would have been nice if they'd labeled this amenity as the same thing as periferico. Uh, but uh, they're, in some ways it's kind of nice, at least they're the same color, so you know they're very similar. Basically, the disamenity zone and the periferico are the same. These are people who are living in, or this is where, uh, people who are very poor live. Uh, this is not your standard lower class housing that you'd find in the U.S. Uh, this is um, referred to by many names. You can see the term I've got up here is squatter settlement. Um, and uh, there, you could also call it an informal settlement, depending on the parts of the world. Uh, they go by different names. So um, I'll have you see if you can go find one in Brazil that's very famous. Uh, but the, the ones in Brazil, especially around Rio de Janeiro, are called favelas. Maybe you've heard that term before, favela. Anyway, um, these are housing houses that will possibly have some sort of connection to electricity um, but often it's done by people not people who work for the government or local electrical company uh, these are people that just figured out themselves essentially if you live in the periferico or in one of these squatter settlements you're you're just happy to have somewhere to live it's not great it's not terrible, at least Latin, not in Latin America. Um, you should go check out some squatter settlements in, I don't know, places like Haiti or Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some in India can be quite bad, but um, Latin America, I guess, if you're if you're thinking all squatter settlements are created alike, they're not, they're not. They're, at least the ones in Latin America, can be uh, somewhat decent. So anyway, um, these people are often um, making things, doing things for themselves, trying to solve their own problems because the government's really not going to solve the problems for them. There's um, no, often they're not officially part of the city. People, as the name tells you, squat. They just squat down somewhere. Uh, oh, here's an open space. I'm just going to build a house here. Uh, sometimes they're very unsafe. Uh, on the sides of mountains or steep hills. So if it rains and there's a landslide or your foundation is not very stable, there can be massive problems in these areas. Um, think about how they deal with getting rid of waste. Uh, they don't really have a connection to city sewer systems. So um, the squatter settlements are, are for people who often are new immigrants to the city that are very poor, so migrants coming from some other part of the country perhaps uh, that are moving to the city for a better life. Uh, the same can be true for, for all the other models we're going to look at. Um, generally in the um, developing world models we're looking at today, the poorest people live on the outside. This is very different than our U.S. urban models. You might remember in the U.S. urban models, the nicest housing is often on the outside. That's where the cheap land is and where you can afford to build your giant houses. So very different uh, in that sense when you compare the U.S. models to these foreign models. So now that hopefully you have an idea of what a squatter settlement is, uh, we'll look at just a few other characteristics here. Uh, I've sort of already done this for you, but when you compare these, uh, this model to the four U.S. models, I put them in parentheses there, the concentric zone, the sector model, the mul multiple nuclei model, the galactic city model, which is it most similar to? You can probably see some similarities to the sector model. That was the one that's kind of like pie slices. So you can see those pie slices coming out from the center here. We've also got some obvious circles within circles. So that's like your concentric zone model. And we've also got a little bit of the multiple nuclei model when you've got uh, the edge city here. So there are some similarities. So what are the differences? Well, uh, none of the models we had really had a, a spine. Uh, the sector model had that area called the uh, transition zone or zone of transition. That was really kind of like highways and industries. So that's not really like the spine here at all. Um, I guess I could also explain just some of the other parts of this that um, I haven't yet pointed out yet. So uh, we've got, as I mentioned, the rich housing, the poor housing. We've got middle class housing sort of in between. And that's kind of what this tan color is over here and over here. So it makes sense. You've got rich, middle-class, poor. As we know, rich people don't 
usually live very close to poor people. There's often a middle class kind of buffer in between. And uh, around the center here, we've got an area that's got um, middle, more middle class housing. That's sort of what the zone of maturity is. Uh, areas that are growing into perhaps um, middle class housing around the center. And the same is true in the zone of in situ accretion. These terms probably don't mean much to you. Uh, and frankly, they don't mean a whole lot to me either. But um, generally what I can tell you is that these are the areas that are slowly improving. Uh, in situ basically just means in the original area and accretion just means improvement. So this is sort of like an area where there's constantly going to be construction or improvement. The, um, I thought there was something else I was going to explain here. Uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. So if you've got time, check out uh, this link, you obviously can't click on it because this is a video, but I've given you a description of what you could look up. Uh, just go to Google and type in just this first word, uh, Rocinha. Uh, in Portuguese, that's pronounced Rocinha. And this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, favelas um, in Rio. If you check it out, it's kind of cool. At least on Google Maps, you can drive through the center of town. You'll see it's got paved roads. It's got a lot of electrical wires. Um, if you're driving around, just uh, find an electrical wire and look at what it looks like when it meets an electrical pole. You can see there will just be like a tangle of wires because people are just hooking up to the electricity that's been uh, brought up there illegally by people in the area. And uh, it's not done officially and it just looks like it's a tangled mess, but it gets the job done. Um, and you'll also notice paved roads and, you know, it's not that bad. Uh, so, you know, I've I don't know if I'd say I, should, I would go there if I were visiting Rio, uh, but uh, it's, it's not a, a slum in the way that you might think of it being the worst places to live in the world. Uh, plus the views are gorgeous. So uh, maybe I'll show you another day, but if you got time, check out Hosinia uh, in Google, at least uh, on Street View or a few pictures of it in Google Images. For the Sub-Saharan city model, we've got uh, some similarities to what we just saw in the Latin American model. Uh, some things that are different, here we've got a much larger industrial zone, mining, manufacturing, and industries here towards the outside. Understandably, just like in our U.S. urban models, they're very close to the informal settlements. These are your uh, poorer neighborhoods. You've got... Um, some uh, what are labeled ethnic neighborhoods. Uh, these reflect in Africa a long history of tribalism. You may remember that um, when we talked about colonialism of Africa, or I should say imperialism of Africa, we talked about how Africa's borders were all divided up and uh, they were done without really any care to pay attention to what, what groups were already there, what ethnic groups are there. And there's thousands of them in Africa. And there's only like 54 countries or 55 countries, whatever it is. So um, obviously that means that there's tons of ethnic groups in every country. So Africa is filled with diversity and these neighborhoods, uh, kind of like in um, Chicago or New York City or LA, they often will have an ethnic flavor to them. People tend to move in with people that they're familiar with or similar to. So uh, you've got a lot of different ethnic neighborhoods uh, spread throughout the, the area outside the urban core. You don't really have a ton of um, elite housing or middle class housing. It does exist. It's often near the colonial central business district. You can see it, that area is the major area as these three roads come together. So like the Latin American model, we've got uh, two CBDs. We've got the traditional one or, um, well, yeah, that's what it's called. Sorry, this is the traditional one. Uh, traditional central business district where again you would have had like local markets and stuff and then the one set up by colonizers and a market zone around there is often a place where you've got uh, more stores for example uh, maybe just more formal stores the colonial CBD is often in a an obvious grid pattern this uh, the same was true in many Latin American cities that wasn't reflected on the Latin American model but a lot of uh, colonizers set up a grid system. That's uh, what made sense to them. Whereas the old central traditional business districts um, that were there before colonizers came off and have these sort of old windy streets, kind of like how a lot of old Europe is. Very windy streets, very narrow. So what are the similarities between this and the Latin, Latin American model? Well, I've already pointed out some. 
Uh, we've got these poor squatter settlements or informal satellite townships, whatever you want to call them, towards the outside here. And they also have a, a CBD that has uh, two parts, uh, sorry, the purple and the yellow here, the colonial and the traditional. Not much to tell you about the Sub-Saharan city model. Now that you've got the baseline for La the Latin American model, again, you'll see quite a few similarities, just uh, different shapes here. This one seems to be very much like the concentric zone model, at least to me. Finally, we have the McGee Southeast Asian city model. This one looks kind of like the sector model where you got these pie slices coming out from the middle. Let's establish this first. Southeast Asia has a lot of coastlines. So you're going to have a lot of ports. And as Europeans colonize these areas, they often set up areas around ports uh, and put the most important functions closest to the ports because you want to be close to where you're going to ship stuff in and out. So the government zone is right near the port. Uh, you've got your high class uh, residential zone right near there as well. Um, and uh, then the farther out you go, uh, the worse the housing gets. So uh, decent housing, middle class, and then these squatter settlement areas where you've got um, A, uh, these two A blocks, and then the B blocks or the suburbs that are a little bit nicer. So um, I'll point out just a couple other things as we go here, but as I mentioned, they're already, or as I already mentioned, they're usually focused on the ports for reasons I've mentioned. And instead of a single central business district, you often have a, a multiple central business districts that are kind of scattered. I'll just describe what the difference is between the AC and the WC. I've given you some small description here for the AC. It stands for Alien Commercial Zone. And again, hopefully you're drawing these uh, so that you can have a better connection or memory, hopefully, of what they look like. So if you didn't catch the uh, Sub-Saharan model, maybe go back and draw that one. If you haven't yet drawn this one, maybe pause the video and draw it. But the alien commercial zone is labeled as predominantly Chinese businesses. China has a, Chinese people have a long history of migrating into Southeast Asia. So um, since there's such a large population of Chinese people and they m have a long history of migrating into Southeast Asia, it's, they sort of stand out when they form their ethnic neighborhoods. Uh, they tend to have very large um, populations in some of these Southeast Asian cities. So that's kind of why they get their own um, specific section here. I mean, uh, the Chinese businesses is my own handwriting. The alien commercial zone is just sort of like generally saying foreign businesses, but they tend to be Chinese mostly. And uh, lastly, you've got your Western commercial zone. So of course, uh, neo-colonialism is still a thing. Uh, Western businesses still want to be around in uh, Southeast Asia for all the reasons any business would want to be anywhere. There's lots of money to be made. So they also have their own connections and you can see their orientation around the ports here for uh, exporting stuff. There is some growth outside of Southeast Asian cities in this brown splotch called the New Industrial Estate or the New Industrial Park. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's an area where there's a lot of industries growing around a market gardening zone. Hey, that connects to our agriculture unit. Look, market gardening right outside the urban core. Uh, it's the cheaper land, but still pretty expensive. So you got to farm something expensive there, very quick to market, so it doesn't perish along the way. Tomatoes, things like that. So uh, the new industrial area outside the city uh, would attract potentially some of these poor workers uh, to go um, work in those factories or whatever. Possibly something for like uh, I don't know, an export processing zone. You've still got your squatter settlements, we've talked about those, and we're done. So you've got a worksheet to try and find some um, versions of these models in real life in Google. Uh, it's helpful, I think, to look at things in uh, Google satellite mode. It's kind of easy to spot some squatter settlements. That's gonna be your telltale sign, I think, for a lot of these cities as to where uh, the, where the outside of the city is. So see if you can spot some uh, squatter settlements or informal settlements. They usually have um, roofs that look like they're brownish in color. Uh, I don't know, that's a terrible description. Um, 
they just don't look very organized. Maybe that's the best way of describing the housing patterns. Uh, roofs of different sizes, um, often like a tan or a brown color, and uh, not really in any sort of consistent block pattern. They're just sort of various sizes and not linear. So see if you can spot some. Um, maybe you can also find uh, where the commercial zones are. Um, so some of these major features of the models might be able to stand out to you if you're looking at a Google satellite or perhaps a regular Google Maps view. So good luck. I'll be excited to hear what you see uh, or found uh, next class. Hope you have a, a great day. I'll see you soon. Bye.